Welcome. We're going to start on time, which is quite something here. Um, so welcome to you all. I'm assuming many of you, all of you, have a good grounding in what ESG is. And that's why you're here. Um, my name is Nick Gowing. I've been running a project for nine years called Thinking the Unthinkable. And it's actually Thinking the Unpalatable. And in many ways, what we're facing now on ESG, on sustainability, on diversity, on nature, on the climate, not crisis, but emergency, is a real challenge on speed. The science from the IPCC uh, of literally a month ago is deeply sinister. We're, we're crossing tipping points at a rate which is even faster than the scientists have predicted. Uh, John Kerry, the uh, president's special advisor on climate change, says we have to move six times faster. And we've got to achieve everything if we can, not by 2050, but by 2030. Similarly, um, we're hearing from others uh, that, that we have to move faster. Even Jabr, the uh, new chair and president of COP28, is saying we have to move at least three times faster. And his chief of staff at the uh, growth summit run by MasterCard, the inclusive, inclusive Growth Summit at the World Bank IMF meeting two weeks ago, said remarkably, we are well behind what we need to do. And he's representing the Emirates of what's going to happen in November. I give you that because I want to start by asking uh, each of our uh, panelists about what their assessment is, really, about whether there's a real commitment on ESG. I have a certain view, but I'd like to hear their view first. First of all, let's go to Kostis Selenis, who uh, is representing the Swiss Impact Office and also for the Hellenic Impact Investing Network. I said maybe 90 seconds if you can do it. Of but course, I, I, probably we want, less. A, we want a reality check at this stage. Sure, sure. Uh, I don't have the data in, in mind right now, but I would say that the majority, over 50% of the companies probably today, are looking into implementing or introducing an ESC policy. I think the picture is different, Nick, when it comes to the implementation of these policies. So I think, I believe at least, that the, the percentage is much smaller when it comes to who is actually implementing or who has a policy. How so many the intention is there in any case, but the question is how many do that? I, I, I believe my colleagues here would know a little bit better about ESG statistics. I'll come to them in a moment, but how much are you being quite polite and saying many talk about it but don't really want to do it? Absolutely. Over 50%? It's a trend. They have to comply. They have to show that at least they're looking into the direction, uh, no matter if they're implementing that or not. Okay. Maria Neveli uh, Benitsa, welcome. Uh, you're from Benitsas. You're a lawyer. Uh, tell us what you do, but also, what's your assessment of how much people are really engaging at the moment? So uh, thank you, Nick. I'm a financial services lawyer. I've uh, just moved to Greece, so I'm part of the brain gain, I guess. Um, and I have worked on the new EU legislation on sustainable finance. So, so that's why I'm here, and that's um, a big passion of mine, trying to channel the conversation towards what is actually required. So moving on to your question as to what's my assessment, I think there is a lot of noise, but there isn't enough drilling down into what is required by law. And I would like to give two examples there. The first example is that, um, and, and this is the case throughout Europe, many companies say that they embrace ESG, but when they have to conform with the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which forces them to categorize their funds as brown, light green, or dark green, um, the majority cannot actually reach the green categories at all. The majority actually um, have to categorize themselves as brown under the regulation. And then uh, another angle to that is that Greece specifically and northern European countries have a large number of small and medium-sized enterprises. And these enterprises are unable to comply with the really onerous requirements of the taxonomy. How much is there a reluctance to even appreciate what ESG is about? In other words, the imperative, both for the survival of the planet, but also what is coming down the track on regulation? I, I, I see what you're getting at, but having seen the legislation itself, I don't think that we can say we 
firms are to blame, they're not doing enough. And the reason for that is that we can't take ESG to mean we need to save the planet tomorrow because all of these companies are there to make profit. So we need to combine the two. We need to combine profit making with sustainable development. And that has been a challenge for regulators to achieve. All right, let's leave it there for the moment. Chiara Conti, welcome from, later. from EY, a partner in climate change and sustainability services leader. What's your assessment about your clients and the kind of uphill battle you're facing? We just heard Rubini in the other, uh, oh, he's still talking probably, talking about not just green washing, but green wishing, yeah. but it actually not being substantive. That's a good one. Well, the good news is that I think in the last two to three years, we've seen a, a very significant trend towards real action. Whereas in the past 10 or more, there was a lot of talk about sustainability in ESG, but no real action. Now, there is definitely the risk of green wishing and green washing, but at the same time, I think the understanding of the difference between what sustainability is and what ESG is, because these are not the same thing, uh, has grown, so that understanding has driven companies to make commitments that actually reflect and align to financial KPIs that link to their profitability and, and growth in the How much years. do you have to explain even the basics of ESG to many of your clients? Well, the truth is that, that there is a lack of, of understanding, not of the theory, but of the connection with the business case. So why is it relevant to them? And then there are a lot of uh, mechanics and um, systemic type of thinking that you can use that links to the specific sector, so it is not the same for everyone, but also links to the specific business model of that company in order to understand both risks and opportunities, but also to make sure that this viewpoint is not a traditional short-term two to three year business plan mindset that we have from the past, but to extend that time horizon of business planning and business strategy transformation to the mid and long term, which is what sustainability is all about. Let me get on to the next part of this, which is, sure. do you believe that ESG as it's currently formulated is adequate? There are many who are already beginning to talk about ESG too. In other words, there's got to be a real new definition to make it more attractive and more achievable make it more attractive, more achievable, and probably to allow it to have the, the results that we're looking for. For us as impact investors, right? So investors focusing on products, services, technologies, business models that are providing a solution to a global environmental and social program, a problem. Uh, we feel that ESG today in its current form, it's obsolete. Literally obsolete. Literally obsolete because it has too many limitations data quality, uh, how do you quantify the targets, transparency, the way that ESG is being done. How do I know that an analyst behind a screen will be able to choose the one or the other company or the one or the other stock based on what the company is already reporting, which is usually also very limited. So there is not a, a bottom-up approach in looking at the company and seeing, okay, what does really the company do? And we shouldn't forget here how ESG is differentiating from impact investing. And the big differentiation here is that ESG is trying to award companies that are reducing their negative impact on environmental society. Impact investing is focusing on companies that have a solution that is being provided for a global problem. So it's more increasing the positive impact rather than minimizing the negative one. So different, two different approaches. Is ESG necessary? Yes, ESG is necessary. You have companies that will never have the impact profile because they're too big and they're too old, um, industries, industrial companies, etc. So we need ESG, but not at this form. Maria, what's your view? About ESG too. Yeah, I, I think about whether ESG was the right principle. I'm, I've got a, a label, a lapel up here. You know, that is a principle. But on the other hand, is it achievable in its current form? Because I'm putting to you that there are already many who are beginning to talk about ESG too. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. And actually, um, I, I support all of the efforts in order to simplify the current ESG framework. So I was recently talking 
to someone who's part of the legislative committee to simplify the taxonomy regulation due to um, the vast uh, problems that people have had with it. And then also, I think there needs to be more emphasis on the S and G element in ESG2, because these have slightly been left to the side in the current framework. So, so yes, all for it. Kira, what, what about you? Because you talked in your notes before we met about the need to clarify the main concepts. Is that clarifying the main concepts of uh, ESG as it is at the moment, or clarifying it into a new iteration? I think the fact that we keep changing the terminology and versions is not helping. So the core of what we need to clarify has to do a lot with linking ESG to the business case. So ESG 2, 3 or whatever, the main principle behind that is to develop the metrics, processes, uh, monitoring mechanisms, systems, reporting and assurance type of, uh, of processes that are based on the concept of double materiality. So this is very important because, as previously said, companies are now focusing on the risk side of things and less on the, on the long-term value creation side of things. And on the other hand, they're developing indicators that have to do with the mitigation side of things. So for example, climate change. We see a lot of uh, ESG indicators on greenhouse gas emissions, whereas we don't see any indicators on how the adaptation results in financial KPIs for the specific companies. Hold you, you talk as well about the how can sustainable finance transform pledges, but you say 2050 pledges. I'd like to put to you that the science says it's got to be achieved much quicker. Yeah. In other words, how do you create real world impact at a speed which is far faster than most are assuming? 2050 is, uh, in essence, it means today, because the first milestone is 2030. So it's but you, do you tell them that but it means today? Yes, but that's exactly what I said before. The time horizon needs to shift. And then coming back to your question, from a sustainable finance point of view, we have, again, two sides. What do corporates need to do to transform their business models? And on the other hand, what do providers of financial capital need to do? If you ask me today, which is the sector in Greece that demonstrates uh, the most, let's say, significant signals of business transformation based on sustainability, the answer would probably shock you. It's the financial institutions. It's not heavy industries. It's not the energy sector. Where we're actually seeing business transformation is primarily in the banking sector. And that goes back to why, and that is linked to the business case, managing risks and opportunities, to the supervisory expectations. And then what does this mean for each bank uh, itself has a lot to do with the KPI discussion we had before. So just, and I'm, I'm, I'm stopping here, but it's, I think it's very interesting that I, I bet that the, on a proportional basis, sector by sector, there is no other sector in this point in time in Greece who has actually done climate physical risk assessment on an asset level for every collateral or uh, asset under management. So, so Costi, let, let's, let's build this forward for impact investing. Sure. What is needed on criteria? What is needed for having an audit to be able to say very clearly for your investors and those who will invest in green, this is a good deal, as sure. opposed to mm, it might be. Sure. Goes in the same direction. Absolutely agree. Um, the, if you go to a dedicated impact investing conference, right, half of the discussions go around measurement and reporting. The reason why this happens is that we even say in the impact community, if you cannot measure it, it's not there. But they, the, the, maybe that's a little bit extreme, but, but, but still what we're trying to communicate is only if you put the framework, we put a framework even before we invest. So while we are having the standard due diligence process, as we all know it, right, financial analysis, we look at the business plan, we look at the legal, we assess the risk. In parallel, we are running an impact due diligence. So in this, in this stage, we're trying to identify the KPIs, even if the company hasn't done that already. Of course, uh, it's, it's, it saves us a lot, a lot of time with the company does it, which again brings the necessity and the discussion of, of a global framework for impact investing as well. Key KPIs, targets that are measurable, and then the whole process of reporting it properly. This is what gives us the information in order to see 
in a dynamic way, not a static way, what is the impact today when we're investing in the company or in the fund or in the stock, and how is the impact going to be tomorrow? It's a dynamic process. So I think that this is the number one parameter. And when we talk about legislation, you mentioned that before, and I wanted to comment on that. For us, legislation is today the minimum. So if I see an impact fund or a fund that tells me we have SFDR 9, so we comply, we're a green fund, this is good, this can fight greenwashing because a lot of people are using the term impact or sustainability today in, the, in a completely wrong way. So we don't only have to fight the mainstream investors and convince them to go more sustainability and impact investing, now we also have to fight the greenwashers. So it's a tough, it's tough fight, but the legislation is the minimum. We go way beyond that minimum. Say, okay, you have SFDR 9 in your fund, but let me look at your KPIs. Let me deep dive in the business model, the business model. Do the KPIs see. have credibility? Because let me put to you, there are those who believe and take seriously what they're trying to do, but they're over-optimistic about how sustainable they really are. Correct. And they need very clear, transparent indices they do. of what is happening as opposed to they do. I'm, cr I'm putting it crudely here, being guess their guess guesstimates. Depends on, the, on, on how they're done. If you have the right experts, and I think that, that, that stands for, for everyone, right? Um, if they do it properly, then, then the quality of these KPIs is high. And if they're monitoring these KPIs over time, also very, very interesting. And Limited KPIs, one fund, one company, what does it tell me? You reduce the water consumption in your building by 20%. And then? Ria. Just to add on KPIs, I think you start with guesstimates whenever you have a new framework. But then the market slowly becomes educated, then the specialists become educated, and it's improved. The regulators start tightening up, and that's how you go forward. And just one other point while I was listening to b both of you cover, co cover what you were talking about, um, I, I think Something that gives me hope and marries up but what, what you're both saying is the new EU green bond legislation, which I think uh, interests people from an investing perspective, but also the financial institutions. How much will it be a burden? I'm, I'm, I mean, all of legislation is a burden. People tell me <laughs> I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but we need it because of yeah, what's of happening with sustainability. Yes. Of course, of course it's necessary. And what it does is it slightly changes the definition of green bond. So up until now, I could issue a green bond by saying that I will invest the pros proceeds that I raise in a project that I consider to be green under my own standards. But in the new world, the, the green projects are strictly defined and you also need a separate verification process. So, so that's promising. Do you think CSRD and CSDD are both encouraging for investors, encouraging from the legal point of view? Are they moving everything in the right direction? New regulations? Uh, y yes, just for, for everyone's benefit. You better um, explain what they are. Yes, yes. So there are corporate sustainability directives. One has to do with reporting. The other one has to do with due diligence. They, I think the big win there is that they increase the firms that are subject to, re to reporting on corporate sustainability and the ex they expand the number of firms that need to perform due diligence and factor in sustainability risks. So why is that important? More firms and most importantly, most importantly, small and medium-sized enterprises will have to report these metrics. And this creates a bit of a spillover effect. There's better data from smaller players. It educates the system. It gives better data to fund managers and so on. So I think that's also very promising as well. I mean, all of this is a lot of cost in terms of reporting. So if, if there's anyone here from the, the public sector or advisors, I would urge them to assist the process of really supporting small and medium-sized enterprises. Well, shall I ask, is there anyone here who'd like to come in on that, supporting SMEs? Small, medium enterprises. Not yet, not yet, but put up your hand. I can see you, a, a bit like a lecture theater, this. 
I, but, uh, I mean, also larger players find it very challenging to comply with, with this legislation. When I was in London, we had um, clients with, with thousands of, of staff and, and they also found it extremely challenging. So, so it's ju I just wanted to highlight the point that it's much harder for the smaller players. All right, I'm going to come to Kira in a moment. Would anyone like to come in? We've got 15 minutes left and I'd like to get any views from any of you and get a microphone to you now. That looks like nobody at the moment, but I'm open. Please, uh, I'll get the microphone to you now. R Kira, just pick, let's pick up on this, about the overall way and speed at which your clients are changing. And whether you feel optimistic that they, does it take uh, examples of the way things have worked to act as an incentive to others who are hovering, wavering, who are not really sure that ESG matters to them? And one comment just for the CSRD in terms of the KPIs that you mentioned before. I think also the fact that these KPIs are going to be assured by uh, external assurers will increase the credibility as well. And part of the legislative agenda has to do a lot with educating the companies itself to, to the ESG standards. But back to your question, um, well, the drivers are, are very specific for someone to get really involved and be actually uh, in a process to, to see the degree that their business model can be transformed. So one is the regulatory legislative agenda that we see it motivates uh, mostly larger companies to comply. Then we have definitely the, all the other transition risks and opportunities. Obviously sustainable finance is one of them, so access to capital is one of the biggest motivations even for SMEs and larger corporates to move into the sustainability path. And here is uh, the, the link to what this means for providers of financial capital. And there are obviously the expectations and needs of the rest of stakeholders. So these transition drivers are what we're seeing, especially in the last, as I said, two, three years, really uh, putting the, the a basic step of, of uh, a basic row of steps for companies to to start integrating sustainability. Okay, I'll come to you now. You've got the microphone. I'd like to give you advance warning of my last question to you. What's it going to take to really accelerate and multiply at the speed that's necessary? You don't have to answer it now. I'll come to you right at the end. Sure. Right, please, and introduce well, yes. I had the pleasure to, to, uh, uh, to be at the other ESG panels uh, on the other sector of the Delphi Economic Forum. And I have to say to you that uh, they were addressing circular economy, ESG, and uh, all have been talking about how we are going to implement the European uh, legislation and European targets in this aspect. But right now, I just heard uh, from this panel that um, the other side of the coin, which is actually the implementation, how this is going to cost to every company, not only the big companies, but also the small and the SMEs, which, of course, if we project it to Greece, we are talking about about 80% of right, the so you'd like to, to, me to ask about cost? Uh, yes, I'd just right. like to address the subject because it bonds really well to the other panels. Right, okay, got it. Okay, who'd like the microphone next? Please, microphone over here. Who's ever, there are two people here. I'll come to you in a moment. The cost, is this going to be an inhibitor? I'm against penalties in general. And but we're not talking about penalties, we're talking about I'll cost. I'll come to that and mandatory compliance, I believe more in incentives. We cannot put on the SMEs the burden of the cost, but we can put them an incentive. I like the guidelines. I like the green guidelines, the new bond guidelines, because the investors also need to be educated. So if somebody wants to raise capital and address this community of investors like us, then they need to comply by their own incentive because it makes sense, because they can have a profit out of that. If we put uh, legislation, mandatory compliance, we can even create, um, create confusion and a lot of costs and what do we do with the SMEs that cannot afford to comply to the standards. And there might be wonderful impact ventures that can excel and can provide solutions to our target. The right. cost is substantial unless we also allocate capital from European Union sources or from DFIs so that there are accelerator programs or support programs that can provide frameworks as the Hellenic Impact Investing Network is doing, for example, by itself already. It provides a framework, a suggestion. You can comply to that education how to comply to that. Kira Maria, do you agree with that? 
I think the, the most important thing is the mind shift that we need to do when it comes to profitability. So the short term horizon needs to change. The, the, the costs associated with integration of sustainability have a short term hit, but on, from the profitability perspective, the mid to long term effect is, is much higher. You know, that, that word, those words, mindset and culture, kept coming up on several panels here on the planet pillar yesterday. Maria, anything to add quickly? I, I think incentives need to come hand in hand with some penalties for, for cases that really stand out. So 100% behind you, but also I think the system needs to help the incentives go in the right direction. All right, please, who's got the mic? Yeah, hello. Introduce uh, yourself, please. I'm sorry. Uh, Introduce yourself. Okay, my name is George Kefalogiannis. I'm from Intellectica. And basically, the sequence of propositions that uh, you actually just posed answer my question. I am more into the incentive kind of spectrum than the penalties. Sure. But So my question, before you answered, before you gave all these propositions that I, I completely agree with, instead of any penalty, the incentive is much better in my opinion. Uh, when it comes to penalties and access to capital and the cost of capital, which is the interest, I mean, finance theory always had this associated with risk premia. Risk premia that has to do with the investment. So now we're trying to incorporate something that has nothing to do with the risk premia that are associated with the investment. So my question was, before you gave the uh, incentives aspect of that, if you try to impose it when it comes to the probability of getting access to capital or the cost of capital in the sense of how high the interest rate would be, how are you going to be able to quantify how much higher the interest rate would be right. if someone is not ESG compliant? Could you pass the microphone back to the lady three, three behind you? Which, there's an additional point to this. How do you encourage people, executives, companies, politicians to accept the enormity of the SDG challenge of what has to be done? In other words, does it, is it going to take encouragement or penalties or a mixture of both? I think the market and the environment is actually penalizing these companies without us needing to put fines um, and on, on the result. We say always that impact investing ESG can be used as a risk mitigation tool. So per definition, companies that don't comply to that, they're going to be riskier and they're going to pay the price for that. We say that companies that are destroying biodiversity, eventually they're going to destroy their own natural resources. Nature is the number one supplier of our economy, and it's the first time that we're understanding that the more we destroy nature, we destroy our economy. Do executives it get hurts. that? Do they get it? If they Gradually they do, and I think you probably, that you do your fantastic research reports there. No. I think this is getting there, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think that the, the number one uh, leverage here is to actually measure the financial cost that you will have by your inaction. Okay. So measure physical, uh, for example, climate physical risk impact, financial impact for your company, both from chronic and acute risks, measure biodiversity loss and what this means for your supply chains and the scarcity of the raw materials that you need, you need for the production process. So once you measure those and actually calculate the financial impact that it brings as a cost to, to the company itself in the short term, mid term and long term, then it's, the business case is more obvious. Has COP15 in Montreal just before Christmas, has that changed the realities? No, it just put biodiversity on the, on the discussion. Okay. I don't think it actually <laughs> has changed anything yet, but it's important because what we're facing now and how everyone knows about what, what's happening with climate is bringing biodiversity in the discussion as well. Maria, that question, do you want to add anything? Just to add on, on executives, I, um, there's a new framework and there are new initiatives to make executives personally liable. So in one of the upcoming pieces of legislation, directors have personal liability yeah. if their supply chain doesn't factor in sustainability. Yeah, please. Hello, Veronique Zerva. I'm in the ESG advocacy space uh, for the financial services. Um, it has been a music to my ears to hear about the double materiality uh, element. Um, and I suppose many of us in this room are hoping that the ISSB standards are going to have that element in it. Um, we talk a lot about data and disclosures, and you talked also about the SMEs. Do you think that because they feel that reporting is an obligation, 
rather than uh, something that they need to do in order to improve their processes and implementation processes. Do you think that, is there any perfect way to address data? In my personal experience, the data is not perfect and it's not going to be perfect. Okay. So, let's leave, let's yeah, leave it there uh, the question the is that. All right, pass the microphone to the gentleman there and I'll come to you in a moment if we've got time. But Maria, do you want to pick up on that quickly? Data, I, I, I mean, the data is imperfect, but that's what we've got to work with. I think we, we need to keep um, improving the system. We need to use data to be better, and that's, that, that, that's part of any new process, really. Kira. Yeah, and coming back to the double materiality concept, I think although it comes from a regulatory supervisory point of view under the reporting context. In reality, it's the corner store of every sustainable transformation strategy. So having a clear view of what double materiality means for your organization, financial impact, and impact to the SDGs in essence, is what actually motivates to, uh, to, to integrate the business model uh, transformation. Number one motivation, reason, to go more impact, to go more sustainable nowadays, and now it's starting, is profitability. It's the return potential. I think that in 15 years from now, we're going to say, are you doing mainstream investments? My God, the, you must have a very bad portfolio of investment. Impact investing, sustainability is all about new economy, solutions, innovation, technologies. So I think this is the number one driver and incentive to go to that direction, and the Thank best you. one. Very quick, if you can. For sure, I'll try. <laughs> My name is Paras Gravognotis. I'm the CEO of Komotini Paper Mill. And I participated in, a, in one of the other sessions uh, yesterday. Um, in uh, Komotini Paper Mill, we are uh, users of uh, energy, both thermal and electric. I came back in 2009 from the UK, where I was a consultant on energy and environmental issues. So what I did is I tried to switch from fossil fuel to biomass. Question, please. For, sorry, forgive could, me. Could I get your question? Because yes, for sure. Uh, what, was, what happened is this, uh, that I, I had a great difficulty in trying to communicate and get in touch with uh, funds. Uh, as family businesses, uh, we have a difficulty in communicating, in communicating and trying to find the time and the resources to be able to ask for, um, ask for uh, funding. So that's one of the hurdles that, that there are, and I wanted to point this out, how you can approach uh, small medium enterprises and what efforts you are making in approaching small medium enterprises that are mostly family based and they don't have the opportunity or the personnel to deal with such issues. Uh, I think we've part the answer to that. Does anyone want to add anything more? Uh, half, a, half a minute. Good consultants that can be integrated in the SME and provide the knowledge that is missing from you, maybe with a small percentage, usually provides that solution for the, for, because you, usually they cannot afford it. That's that's what I would say. Okay, in the time available, I gave you notice of the question, which is what can be done to speed this up in a way which satisfies the, the scientists of where we're going um, in terms of the, the awfulness, the sinister nature of what we all face in terms of planetary survival. Kira, what, what, what is gonna speed this up? Business case awareness from the board level down and top up and bottom down, bottom up, top down. Uh, but most importantly, what I said before, I think it's the link to the business case in terms of profitability, not just a risk-based cost type of uh, discussion. And in order to do that, you need to actually measure the impact. And this goes back to your original question back there. If we're going to make it, if we're going to actually uh, meet the agenda 2030, and that goes back to impact thinking, not just financial uh, impact, but impact materiality. Completely agree. I think the profitability offering needs to be more attractive. If it is more attractive, then financial services firms will rush to grasp the opportunity. Does attractive mean bigger profits or profits which have been gained in a sustainable way but maybe lower than they are at the moment? It doesn't have to be bigger necessarily. It could be more sustainable over a longer period of time or um, more promising. Um, in, in terms of what results they bring. We already see that companies fully agree, fully in line, that companies are actually awarded with their product, solution or technology if they're integrating environmental and social criteria. For me, we have to remove, in order to speed it up, 
to answer your question, we have to remove the bottlenecks. One major bottleneck is education and awareness around what sustainability is, what better ESG is, what impact investing is. Education, awareness. Half of the audience here probably don't even know, uh, doesn't know what needs to be done in that direction. So the less they know, the more they're going to move into that direction. I think education and awareness is, diff is, is, is number one. And then we lack talent. Another major bottleneck in the sustainability industry. We don't have enough good people that can run these strategies, that can help us run these strategies. All right, ESG has to be, is so important, it's got to be redefined, and there are a lot of uphill challenges to get there at the speed that's necessary to save our planet. Thank you all very much indeed, and thank, thank you. you for being here. Thank you very much. <laughs>